Well, following one of the more impressive victories in the history of the Boys State football program, all is well in Bronco Nation once again. Welcome on into Jay Sports Bar alongside Shane Williams Rhodes. I'm Jay Tuss. Boise State knocking off a 10th ranked opponent on the road for the first time since 2001. Shane, last week we were talking about how Boise State was following a negative storyline to the 2001 season. Now, though, they followed the one positive storyline to that season, getting a historic road victory over a top 10 team. I mean, all is all is good again, right? I mean, I couldn't have uh, asked for a better win as far as being the team who we get to beat and the team that was probably the highest ranked team we'll play all year. Uh it's been great, man. I've been seeing BYU fans all week uh, coming in and out of my gym. And, you know, for the last few years, it's been tough. I've been taking it on the chin, but I've been making sure and reminding them that uh, that we put it on them this past weekend. Hey, I, I know because, like, their Boise State plays BYU so frequently that they might, you know, may, maybe some fans could dismiss how hard it is to go into Provo and win. But, I mean, you, you've been – couple short ends of the stick we'll just call it uh when you've gone when you went to Provo as a player like how hard is it to go there and win you know I it's really hard I, I've never been there and won so uh, I don't know if I can even speak to how they're feeling because uh it's a hostile environment you know I know the uh, LDS community you know are they're really nice people but when you get in that stadium it is not the same it's a hostile environment <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness 72,000 strong uh were absolutely rocking early in that game BYU goes up 10 to nothing Shane straight up man I thought it was going to be a long day for the Broncos I, that it was like kind of at that moment in the game where it was really going to test what this team had in them and they were going to go one way or another and at, at that point in time they were able to just physically impose their will on BYU the rest of the game. And straight up, that's kind of been a storyline of this team. Like, we had kind of been waiting to see that out of this squad. And to show up on the road and do it against a BYU team that has one of the best offensive lines in the country, I mean, uh, I, I just couldn't walk away more impressed from how B Boise State was able to get that done. For me, Shane, being able to go on the road and get a victory like that, it suggests that, that is a culture type of win. If you don't have something right over there in, inside the Gene Blameyer Football Center, when it comes to the culture, you don't come back and win that game. You don't come back from being down 10 nothing. Agreed, yeah. And what was the shocking, most shocking part to me was that we won the battle in the trenches. And I know when I played and since yeah. I've left, the one thing that we always know is that they're going to have a gruesome offense and defensive line. And those guys, and those guys, we won the line of scrimmage. And the thing that I hate most about us playing so good last week in the trenches is that this week we play a triple option <laughs> team. And so we don't really have a chance to build off of that. And so it gives you a totally yeah. different look. It doesn't matter what kind of scheme you went in with last week, if it worked, if it didn't work, because this week, it's a totally different game. It's like you're not even playing football this week. It's like you're out there playing rugby. So I, it sucks that we can't build it, off of what we had last right. week. Right. I mean, can, can we can we can we get can we have just a second here to live in like the glory though? Like we'll worry about Air Force here in in a, in a moment, okay, Shane? Like <laughs> we're we're just gonna celebrate the good here for a second. <laughs> I think the one one of the cooler things about that victory too. Shane, you were talking about like winning the battle in the trenches. Like, absolutely. That's at like the forefront of our storylines coming out of the, the BYU game. I just think another thing that was really cool about that contest is how many guys impacted the game one way or another. And so many of them aren't household names. In the past, when Boise State has gone on the road and, and scored big time victories, whether it be the Fiesta Bowl and you know, Thomas Spurbeck had, you know, 199 receiving yards in that game. And and Jay Ajay scores a couple of touchdowns. And the first time he touches the rock, he houses one from midfield. Like, it seems like in the past when Boise State has gone on the road and they've upset these teams, it's like the stars that shine the brightest. In this case, it was so many of these, like, guys stuck down the depth chart for one reason or another that highly impacted the game. Alex Tubner, Tyler Crow, 
uh, Andrew Van Buren, Jackson Cravens, who had, had a key uh, fourth down stop out at midfield. So many guys contributed to that victory. And I would assume, like, if you go into the locker room after a game like that, and so many guys kind of having their hands on it, that has to be like probably one of the more gratifying feelings that, that a locker room can experience. Cause again, everybody feels like they contributed to do it. I think as a fan, the best part about this win and what I liked about like what you were saying is that we're, we seem like we're really deep as far as the depth chart goes. Obviously we're thin because a lot of guys have hurt, but, the guys that are having mm -hmm. to step in and step up, they're still coming in and making this almost the same plays that the guys who would have been in originally were making. And so that's what's huge. Like you said, whether it's at running back, you know, we got fourth string running backs playing. We got third string corners playing. We got guys getting injured in the game, guys coming into the game. We didn't even know we were going to be missing corners. We have just so many different – we have people getting ejected, just things going on everywhere. And no matter what, the next man up mentality, this is actually a team yep. that no matter what you think about that uh, cliche, that this is actually a team that has that mentality and they prove it. Like whoever's the next person in, they're coming in, they're making plays. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's happened all year. Mm -hmm. It happened in UCF. It ha it's, happen it's been happening constantly and we just keep seeing it. I, I haven't done a deep enough dive into this yet, but I would assume like some of the more successful teams in Boise State history have also probably been some of the more healthier teams in Boise State history. I mean, when you were here, for the most part, I remember the offensive line staying very healthy. If you go back to the 2011, 2010 years, like, yeah, Boise State was loaded with, uh, you know, uh, Chase Baker, Shea McClellan, Tyrone Crawford, Billy Wynn, like all those guys, they were loaded in deep up front. But also all of those guys seem to stay healthy. And so this year, that hasn't necessarily been the case. They've lost guys, especially on the defensive line, for one reason or another. It's it, With that being said, like it shouldn't be easy. We're kind of buried on the depth chart initially, rose of the against the highest level of competition that, as you said, Boise State will probably face this year. Right now, I know that Oklahoma State is ranked above BYU. I would love to see that game. I, I, I think that – I still think BYU's got a good squad. I don't think they played very well last Saturday, and I think Boise State took advantage of it. Uh, probably the thing that you can really point to, Shane – the three turnovers Boise State forced, and that doesn't necessarily even include the two turnovers on downs that Boise State forced in plus territory against BYU. Yeah, what do you have? Yeah, I totally agree. You had four and four of those turnovers, and then you also had a turnover on downs. Those are huge, and I agree. I think we got – we. I think we created turnovers. I don't think they just gave them to us. I think we actually created them with fumbles. Uh, their hits, their strips, their things like that. We created turnovers, but I also feel like BYU didn't play their best ball either. But it was just, to me, I kind of got a weird feeling from this game because I felt like, if you look at the first quarter, BYU was averaging probably like eight, nine yards of play. Mm -hmm. One sec. <laughs> Shane's dog in the background chiming in on this thing. I, I agree with you in the sense that BYU didn't necessarily live up to their standards in that game. And I, got, I have a stat that probably backs that up. Boise State only had 312 total yards of offense in that game. And when you consider the fact that um, BYU, since 2005, is nine or is, is 46 and four at home when they hold opponents under 320 total yards 46 and four when they hold opponents under 320 total yards Boise State only had 312 in that game and they were able to, to win so no doubt kind of an anomaly I will also add Boise State has another one of those victories two out of the four they also won there with only 300 total yards back in 2017 behind a, a strong performance from Alexander Madison so not necessarily a typical effort out of BYU. If they play that game 10 times, Shane, straight up, I don't know if the, if we see the outcome we saw last Saturday again because I, I think the BYU would approach the game a little bit differently um, than they did straight up. But, uh, yeah, Boise State was able to roll up their sleeves and get it done and take advantage of, of a 
of a semi off day, I think you could say for BYU. Yeah, totally agree. And then I think that second quarter was huge. I mean, BYU didn't have a first down. They went from almost getting a first down every play Crazy. in the first quarter to in the second quarter, they couldn't do anything. And then they came back out in third mm -hmm. quarter and they were just kind of seemed like they were getting it going again. And then they would drive it a little bit, turnover, drive it a little bit, turnover. And so I think it just, like you said, this was just one of those weeks where they didn't play their best ball and we played offensively. We didn't play our best ball, but defensively we've created turnovers and it's just hard to, if, yeah. if you win the turnover battle, you usually win the game. Yeah, this is not fan. Reality is not fantasy football, Shane. Reality is not playing Madden or NCAA and trying to rack up numbers so you can contend for a Heisman in a uh, in, in a fake world or whatever, right? Like reality is doing what it takes to win a football game. I would like to bring up too, the reason why Boise State had 312 total yards of offense is because they put themselves in a position to win a game with only 312 total yards of offense. They created great field position with those turnovers because they were up. They slowed the game down even more than they started to at the beginning of the game. We could re -queue up last week's version of the podcast, and I, I feel like we hit on a number of things that Boise State did. One of those was complimentary football. BYU has a very good offense. The one way that you can contain a very good offense is making sure that they stay on their sidelines. And Boise State, for the first time this season, I feel like uh, dictated their own tempo to help their defense. And Boise State's defense is banged up. They did a good job of of not putting too much on their shoulders in that game. The Boise State defense had did just enough that the, the Broncos could come out victorious uh, against BYU. So I feel like complimentary football, forcing turnovers, winning those battles that really matter when it comes to scoring an upset, Boise State was able to do that effectively. I'm interested to see now what it looks like moving forward. Yeah, I mean, you've actually – hit on this i think the last three weeks that boise state has not been throwing it to the back side of the backfield uh something we need to do and i want to say this game we had a we had a career high since tim's been here and i think they had about six or seven catches out of the backfield by backs uh and those plays were going for five and six yards a pop and so that's that right there is plays that could have been negative runs that we've been getting, but instead they're check downs and they're lit, they're allowing our backs to kind of be in space against linebackers. And that was huge. I know a few times I was like, oh man, it's second down and 10. He's not running around in the pocket. He just dumps it off. He gets six yards. Boom. It's a positive play that we have not been getting. And you've been touching on that. You said that they you, his offenses usually average about five or six catches from the backs and i think that's what we had this week this past week and it, so that was huge it, it can be so non second the importance of an offense not getting behind the chains being in in, in third and three versus third and ten or even further back because you're holding on to the football too long and you take a sack it it it's just crazy how much that changes what you can do on third down i mean if it's third and three you still have the ability to run the football if you're third and ten or more you're not going to be able to run the football. <laughs> That's just not an option. So uh, to see them do that, and, and, and it, you know, credit where credit is due. This is another thing to point out. Hank threw for 172 yards, which was which was really by far a season low for him this year. But I also think you could argue that it was one of his best games of the season because again, he put himself, he put his team in a position to win a very tough football game. Tim Plow told us this week that Hank checked out of 15 plays. Um, and they ran 74 total plays, and that includes three kneel downs at the end of the game. Either way, that, that's roughly 20% of the plays that were sent in that Hank changed in order to try to put Boise State in a better situation at the line of scrimmage. And, and Tim Plow was very complimentary of his ability to do that. And so even though Hank didn't put up monster numbers, I think that Hank – it was one of Hank's more impressive performances because he did what it took for his team to win a ball game. And he also didn't make that one play that we we seem to talk about as, a, as Monday morning quarterbacks. He didn't make that play against BYU. And I assume Shane as a quarterback and as a wide receiver, maybe maybe you're an exception because you, you were more of a, of a guy that didn't stretch the field so much. Maybe you liked playing against a team that dropped eight. 
but I would assume as a quarterback and as a wide receiver, it's probably kind of frustrating to go against the defense. And that's typically what BYU does, dropping eight because they're going to take a lot away a lot of your downfield stuff. So you have to be patient. You you if if and if you're not, you're probably going to make a mistake. Yeah, agreed. And I'm I'm sure Hank hated it, but he also loved it because it also gave him a little bit more time in the pocket. Cause I know I think Good it was point. a huge third down third down play that he threw an under route to Octavius Evans on third and like nine. And because he was able to sit there and allow him to get all the way across the field and then dump it off only like two yards in front of him, it allowed, he had enough time to actually let that play develop. But in the past, we have not been able to see him sit in the pocket that long, throw an under route where someone can catch it and then run 10 yards and still get the first down. So that was, uh, that was really, really, something that kind of stood out to me. So it kind of shot BYU in the foot a little bit because they allowed him more time to sit back there. And even with the check downs, he had more time to, you know, go through his progression, check it down to the running back. Well, before he's running for his life, he has no time to check it down. So it was, Mm -hmm. I think BYU thought going in that they would be able to get enough pressure with the amount of guys that they were were bringing, but they weren't. And that was huge. They weren't. Yeah, I I think that credit where credit is due. Boise State has found something up front on the offensive line that appears to be working. I think that Jake Stetz at left guard next to John Ojuku at left tackle gives Boise State an incredible amount of talent. And I think that they have just decided, hey, we're, we're going to rework this. We're going to figure out what works best. And at the very least, we know that putting our two offensive linemen on one side gives us something if we need it. And I think you saw late in that game, there were a lot of runs that, that went left again behind those two to try to finish off, off that game. There was a commitment to the run. Boise State ran the ball 40 times for 140 net rushing yards against BYU. The Broncos over the last uh, decade are 56-7 and seven and 2-0 and this season when they have 40 or more carries in a game as a team. I think that the ability to run the football too – Also set up Khalil Shakir for finally being able to get that zero coverage. And then we just see Khalil go what Khalil does best. And he makes that that, that game-changing, game-clinching play, if you will. And um, the ability to run the football makes a huge freaking difference. And and I know that we've been talking about it. I know that Boise State has wanted to do it. I know that that at times they have done it effectively, but the sacks and the bad snaps have – have you know everybody is kind of more or less you know misperceiving I guess of of what they're capable of but on a Saturday in week six of the 2021 college football season they finally eliminated the negative plays and we actually got to see what this ground game can do yeah and I don't I know you're the stat guy so you might know but I'm not 100 percent sure on it I wish I could know what the yards after contact uh, mm-hmm. yard, yardage was for the running backs because this week they did what we said we haven't been seeing out of those guys, and they were running through tackles. They were not getting tackled yep. by the first guy. There was tons of plays. I mean, when I rewatched the game, um, I watched it with a friend, and he and he was complaining about the offensive line, and I, it was literally on a seven-yard run. And he was complaining about the offensive line. And I was like, he got seven yards. He's like, yeah, but, you know, he got hit for the first time in the, back, in the backfield, but he's just running through tackles. And so that was something that was huge this week, whether it was Andrew. Uh, I mean, everyone was just running through the first yeah. tackler. So I think that was huge for us. I think that Andrew Van Buren is all of a sudden um, – he had great expectations coming to Boise State. Let's just say that. And so this this might sound harsh, but I don't know if Andrew Van Buren has necessarily completely lived up to all those expectations. But this year, I will say that, man, he has been so solid for this team. He has a role. He knows his role. He is owning his role. Most of that has been inside the red zone and really inside the five-yard line where he's been an absolute beast. Um, but in this game, because Cyrus Abibilikio got dinged up, he got even a greater opportunity to run out towards midfield a little bit more. And Andrew Van Buren, his running style absolutely fed to the mentality that Boise State had going into that game against BYU where they were going to try to basically beat them up. And they did beat them up. Shane, we can talk about the turnovers. We can talk about Khalil's catch. We can talk about yards after contact. <clears throat> Excuse me. But for me, I still think the biggest moment of the game 
and I might I might be overselling this, but I just think it, I just think this was the biggest moment of the game was coming out of the second half and possessing the ball for almost half of the third quarter. And this was after Boise State dominated the second quarter, went up by 10 at halftime, and they continued just to leave BYU's offense on the sideline. I mean, I, I'll have to go back, but for, for probably the better part of an hour of, of real time, the BYU offense was hardly, if ever, even on the football field. And, I, you know, trying to find a rhythm, it's impossible when, when you spend that little time on, on the football field. But that's what Boise State had to do in order to win the game. And they came out, they ran the ball effectively, they controlled clock, they did all these little things that you need to do as an underdog in order to win. And I, I really do think that Andy Avalos, th this was intentional 100%, I feel, on uh, by Boise State. Andy said after the game that, you know, when it comes to our tempo, we have to be able um, to to adjust that, to dictate that, to um, whatever the game calls for, that's what that's how we have to operate that. And so when we think of this this offense, I think we think of up-tempo, we think of running plays every 16 seconds or whatever it was. Boise State ran one play every 27.2 seconds of game clock against BYU. That was by far their slowest tempo of the entire season. Yeah, I mean, we've seen the third quarter woes that we've had all year. We dominated mm -hmm. the second quarter didn't allow a first down we scored points we were able to control the ball then we come out in the third quarter where we're used to seeing us come out and go three and out for about two or three drives straight not score any points uh typically get scored on that quarter we came out and we had a six minute and 30 second drive <laughs> and i think that goes back to the fact that we were able to run the ball if you're able to run the ball, you can control the yep. tempo a little bit more. You can hold the ball a little bit more. We didn't have to come out and throw the ball for 14 plays to get the ball down the field and have incompletes, right. which don't allow the clock to move. But since we were running the ball and throwing the ball, it we were allowed, so we were able to control a lot of the tempo. And we've said it all year. We we can't run the ball. You, you can't. It's hard to win the game. But we were able to run the ball in this game, which is just. Honestly, if you would have asked me at the beginning of the season, name one team that you will not be able to run on this year, this would have been the team that I guessed. And so <laughs> it just it just throws yeah. us for a huge loop that we were able to do that. And, yeah, uh, BYU didn't touch the ball until it was about eight minutes and 30 seconds left to go in the third quarter. And so you're already yeah. down. And, and, big. Yeah, and, and by then you could kind of tell when they took the field after that drive that it was – they were – I mean, I really did feel like they, they were starting to press because – when you chew up basically one fourth of the clock in the second half, all of a sudden you can start easily doing the math in your head of how of how many possessions you're down and, and how many possessions you might have left in the game. And at that point in time, BYU was probably starting to press because they knew that they needed touchdowns. Like they had to get mm -hmm. touchdowns. And so following that drive, they actually moved the ball down the field very effectively. But Tyreek Jones comes up, forces a fumble, gives it back to Boise State. They don't get points following that. But they held on to the ball again for almost four and a half minutes. And mm -hmm. so then BY gets back on the field and they're looking up and like, damn, it's almost the end of the third quarter. Like, what what are we gonna do? How do we how do we win this football game? And then even in the fourth quarter, you go on Jaron Hall, who's a fantastic talent, a quarterback for the Cougars. Again, he he started throwing a lot of deep shots downfield. And I think that they thought they could take advantage of of Boise State's inexperience at cornerback. But um Still, by doing that, I think you can kind of tell that they they felt like they they were trying to get more back than they than they could as as quickly as possible, and so they they weren't able to do that. I thought again, all things considered, the 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 guys that had to rise up and and carry the flag as Boise State has long said in the secondary did a great job. Another area that this coaching staff deserves credit for. I don't know where this team would be without Cyrus Habibi Likio and Caleb Biggers. This staff went out and got those guys in the transfer portal. Caleb was at Bull Green, um, where he had 26 career uh, appearances in college football, 19 career starts under his belt, 100 career tackles. He's a physical tackler. His first start for Boise State, he goes out and leads the team in tackles from the cornerback position with nine. Cyrus Habibi Likio, an Oregon transfer 
if if they don't have him, the loss of George Halani all of a sudden feels way more impactful. And now instead of Andrew Van Buren being asked to be a complimentary back, he's being asked to be your starting running back. And for huge sample size, we found out last year that 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 might not be the the way that you can get the most explosion out of your offense. And more than just Andrew, last year they didn't have much depth behind Andrew, so it just put a lot on his plate. Uh, by adding mm-hmm. Cyrus and Caleb, it definitely has made a difference on this defense because now you lose Markel Reed at cornerback, and instead of going to a guy that doesn't have any starting experience, you plug somebody in there that including this season has, you know, 21 games now of starting experience under his belt, 112 career tackles. That is a lot different than, than you know, trying to ask somebody else who's never been in these situations before to play a way bigger role. Yeah. And I know there will be people out there who don't totally understand uh, your Andrew Van Buren uh, reference on why he, you know, probably isn't the guy to be the starter and he has yeah. a role. But for those people, if you've been watching college football for a while, let's take it back to 2005 when uh, USC used to play. Uh, they had a guy named uh, Lindell White. Yep. And that guy, uh, people would always be mad when they take Reggie Bush out of, out of the out of the game in the red zone. But it was a reason because they had a guy who his role was short yardage. And we knew when that guy fell, he was going to fall forward and – it is what it is. I mean, that's his role. And I think that's the same exact role that Andrew Van Buren has on this on this team, whether he's the, yeah. even though he's listed the number three back when they get in the red zone, he is in the game. And we saw him have a really physical touchdown run this week. Yep. Uh, and I was like, geez, it seemed like he threw like three guys off of him trying to get in. Yeah. Yeah. He ran yep. like 10, 15 yards just to go two yards. But he ran through the tackles and that's his role. And that's why he was in the game. So that uh, I think they found that they've. I saw him. I saw him line up at a fullback on like a third and one and get a first down. Mm-hmm. And so he's he's found his role. That's perfect for him. And I like that they've. I like that they were able to switch out so many backs and figure out. I mean, we saw Tyler Crow get a get a carry. They, they have guys just yep. moving around everywhere, they put plugging them in where they can. I know some of it's because of injury, but they're doing a good job of rotating them and and getting guys in and 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 playing to their strengths. Hey. I could not agree more with you, and you kind of triggered another thing that I wanted to talk about today. I think the one thing that made Chris Peterson such a dynamic and good head coach and a reason why it seemed like everybody. To the day, Shane, I have – I I mean, it is crazy. To the day, I have not talked to a past player that was ever like, Chris Peterson was unfair and mean. And there, I've talked to guys that also got booted off the team, and and they still did not have that opinion of him. He was a master of making everybody valuable to a team, and making everybody feel important to, you know, accomplishing something, identifying a strength of someone, and saying go star in that role. And for whatever reason, that said player bought into it like there was not like none other, right? And so for, I can't, I mean, again, I, I know that it might have sounded a second ago that I was being critical maybe of, of Andrew Van Buren, but man, I, I'm not. Like, I, I think that they have found his identity. They have found his role. He has completely embraced it. Players on the team love him. Andrew Van Buren is a huge part of this team's success. And so I, I just think it's cool to see because straight up, man, coming into the season, again, if I'm just being honest, I wondered if Andrew – uh, had hit his ceiling here at Boise State. I wondered how impactful he was going to be behind George Alani and behind Cyrus Abibi Lakio. And he has found a way to be as impactful as any of them. And again, it's because the coaches, I think, identifying what he's good at and saying, go star in this freaking role. And so I, I just think that's that's a good quality to have in a, in a football team and, and in a football staff, I think. Yeah. I, yeah. I think Tim did a really good job with that. Um, yeah, like you hit the nail on the head with Coach Pete. That was his thing. I mean, he always told us uh, everyone here has a role. We know what the role is. And if you don't like your role, then you have the ability to change it. But I think uh, they did a really good job changing Andrew Van Buren's role. And he's really starring in it. And I think he's been more productive playing in the role he's in now than he was yeah. before. And, and we don't know. I mean, his, his role could expand this week, you know, because – 
Cyrus left last week's game early. Um, you know, just trying to read between the lines. George Halani is probably going to miss some time. We don't we don't really know. I mean, he was he he wasn't active against BYU. Andy said following the um, uh, Nevada game that he injured lower body uh, soft tissue injury that he had before. That took him a couple weeks to get back from that. So, um, the boy said as a buy after Air Force. Typically, if you have guys that are you know right on the fringe of getting back from an injury, you probably play it conservative, hold them out. So now they get that second week and really even a third week because you don't play until the following Saturday. So you, you all of a sudden create this bunch of time where you can rest up and get healthy. Um, so yeah. he, he could play a much bigger role this week. I'm not exactly sure. I, I, I do want to ask you, though, Shane, because I just brought it up. You know a lot more guys that play for Chris Peterson um, on, on a on a you know a, a deeper level than I do. Uh, did 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 anybody ever complain about how they in, in, were were treated or if it was unfair? Because I, again, I I really have I I've never heard a story of, about it. Like I've never heard one guy about say yeah Chris Peterson was unfair. I'm just curious. No, and what's crazy about that is a lot of times on a team when you have <laughs> coach feet used to call them locker room lawyers so the guys who you know don't feel like they're getting the playing time they, they're supposed to have like you know they feel they're better than someone else so they're kind of the guys who talk negative in the locker room kind of give a bad aura to but even with those locker room lawyers that we used to have in the locker rooms uh, it was never directed at pete you know it was more of you know, position coach wise, you know, but, uh, you know, uh, we've had another coach since then where that might not have been the same uh, way they felt about the situation. If you I mean, could read between up, those. Uh, yeah, yeah, straight <laughs> up. I, I mean, kind of what I was implying. And I'm not saying that guys that complain were right or wrong or anything like that. That's probably a, a whole nother discussion for another day. But I that that's kind of my point is you didn't necessarily always hear that out of the last you know, staff that was at, at Boise State. I mean, just this is what it is. I'm just, I'm, I'm just passing along what I've heard from people that yeah. have been in the fire, you know, and so I know that you're doing the they, same too. Yeah, so you'll have guys transfer when Pete was here, but they weren't upset with Pete. So they still, when they leave, they still feel the same way they felt when they were here. Uh, so, yeah, you, you're right. You are totally right. Yeah. And I love that he I gave Boise State a shout out on uh, Fox Sports this week. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, how about that? Chris Peterson uh, is now in the media, <laughs> but I mean, he's he's on uh yeah Fox's uh Big Fox or what what do they call it? Big Big Game? Day? I can't even remember what they call their their show over there. But uh, yeah, he talked about Boise State. Get get a little go Broncos after Boise State upset at upset uh, BYU. That was kind of cool. I'm not gonna lie, that was kind of cool. I'm sure it made a lot of people in Bronco Nation feel pretty good about it too. So now, you know, this thing progresses forward, Shane. College football, you get such a short amount of time to celebrate your successes before you have to just start uh, beating your head against the wall about the next opponent you have to prepare for and try to beat. And uh, we live in such a what-have-you-done-for-me-lately society that now Boise State has to try and tackle, quite literally, a 5-1 and Air Force squad that is off to their best start in decades. And as you were kind of already referencing earlier, very little of what happened last week to make this team successful, X's and O's wise, will actually apply to this game against the Falcons. Yeah, you're going to play a team who uh, we created, I think we created, what do we have, three fumbles last week? Forced, we forced three fumbles. Yeah, so I, I, earlier, by the way, you got me, Shane. It was it was four total turnovers, three fumbles, and then uh, Noe Kaniho had the uh, game clinching interception. So four total turnovers and two more turnovers on downs by BYU. So really six turnovers. Yeah, you're gonna have a team this week who runs the ball 95 percent of the time. So I know for sure these guys do ball security every day in practice. That is that is a huge focal point. They're a disciplined team. They're going to be disciplined on defense. They always have a good defense. I mean, even on the mm -hmm. best of years that we've had at Boise State, we've always had some struggles with the Air Force. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, this is going to be a huge week, and it's just going to be a totally different type of mindset going into this game. I know you said uh, Caleb Biggers, um, he led the team last week in tackles, and we're going to need that this week. 
And so that's a good thing to hear that guys on the perimeter can tackle because this week it's going to be the guys on the perimeter who they're going to leave unblocked. They're going to take, they're going to grab those safeties and they're going to grab those linebackers and put a guy on them. The guys that are going to be left unblocked will be corners this week. And so you, you got to be ready to put on your big boy pants because they're, they're, it's like you're starting fall camp all over again, learning a whole different defense because yep. you, gotta, you got guys popping at your feet. You, it's going to be all kinds of chaos going on. It'll be interesting what Boise does on defense this this week because in the past, not so much last year, but more previous years, like even Kekala Kaniho, who's a nickel, they played him at cor at cornerback against BYU or excuse me against Air Force, and so it'll be interesting to see if they kind of mix up um, the secondary to put you know their better tacklers in position. But it's encouraging that Caleb Biggers is so physical and. And you know that he'll he'll probably be up for the challenge if if that is indeed the case. Uh, interesting insight there, by the way, Shane. Um, I you know with uh, with with Boise State coming home, I it is it's it, it just it baffles me uh, in college football how quickly you know storylines and narratives can change. And I do think like this week after beating BYU, I feel like they've the Boise State has kind of hit the reset button on the season. And if you look at social media, man. Retweets and likes are through the roof this week about the Broncos. I feel like there's a lot of energy. But this is, a, I mean, I can't state this enough. This is an incredibly tough Air Force team coming to town that has already exceeded their expectations for the season. We focus on their ability to run the football, but one thing that does make them dangerous, and it has made them dangerous in the past, is they can throw it a little bit too. And so they're very explosive on offense. They're the number one rushing attack in the country. They're five and one on the season, and I, I guess what I'm another thing I'm getting to is just the fact that this is Boise State's toughest schedule, I think, in school history. You have to open up on the road, over two thousand miles away from home, against UCF, who has a quarterback that is as good as any college football quarterbacks in the country, probably. You come home, you eventually have to play a, a team in Oklahoma State that's now ranked 12th in the country. After that, you get Nevada, who's got a first round talent at quarterback. And then you got to go on the road to play 10th ranked BYU. And then you come home and you play the best Air Force team that they've had in decades. I mean, like you just, this schedule up until mid October has just been unrelenting. And I should add, too, you know, how Boise State crushed UTEP 54 to 13. And, it looked like that was just, you know, Boise State putting it to a lowly squad. The Miners are 5-1. and one. Their only loss this season is to Boise State. I think it's the toughest schedule the Broncos have, have played definitely since I've been here. Have, have they maybe played a uh, more top-notch caliber opponent? Maybe. But one through six? Man, I, I can't think of a more daunting schedule than this. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, yeah. What is that? Total uh, total losses for the teams that have beat us? What are we at? About maybe four out of oh, three? Yeah, out of three I mean, UCF's got two. UTEP's got one. Oklahoma State's undefeated. BYU's only got one. Nevada's got a couple. I mean, it's every single one of those teams is, 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 is well on their way, their way to bowl eligibility. What was that? And UCF, yeah, UCF doesn't even have their quarterback. They lost him a few weeks ago. Right, yep. So that's a totally different team, obviously, without the starting quarterback. So, yep. yeah, this is – I would definitely have to agree with that statement that this is the hardest – If this – I'll tell you this. This schedule that this team has played is harder than the 2014 year when we were two – when we were three and two. Those first yep. six weeks where we lost those games, we did not lose to teams that were that much better than us. This team has lost to some really good teams. Yeah. And they've almost beaten some really good teams. As Hank Brockmeyer said after the game against BYU, we finally played well in the third quarter. We finally finished the third quarter. And that in, in many cases, they Boise State could very well be five and one if they if they just did a better job in the third quarter. I'm gonna give Nevada their their due because they they earned that victory. That's not one of those games where you say, ah, if this went different, one or two plays, the outcome of that game is different. Nevada. They won that game. Outside of that, Boise State was very much in any other any other contest of the season and could have, would have, should have, uh, you know, been five and one. They're three and three. They are trying to win back to back games for the first time this season. It's, that's just kind of crazy to me, given the strength of their schedule. 
somewhat understandable though. Um, as we look at Air Force, and you've already said, you know, cornerbacks are going to have to tackle because those are often the guys that are going to be unblocked when you're going against Air Force. What else has to go Boise State's way? Because I, I think for me, you might have to win a game without winning the turnover battle. And I, I just say that because Air Force is very good at limiting those opportunities. They run the football. They don't put it in the air a ton. So this might be one of those weeks where you have to find a way to win without one of the more decisive stats in your favor that 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 could propel you to a victory, and that's the turnover margin. All right, Jay, I might be in left field with this one. Gee, I just stay with me here. All right, so let's just throw out the BYU game. Outside of the BYU game, we have not been able to stop the run. So that has been our thing. We're obviously playing a team who can who's the best running team in the nation. But I think our inability to stop the run with our current scheme that we've used all year might play in our advantage. I think us switching to a different scheme, I think we might play better in whatever scheme we choose to go with against Air Force versus the one we usually play with against traditional teams. I need you to, you gotta elaborate on this, man. I, I, I need more. I, I feel like because we know that this team is gonna run obviously more, like usually you could say, all right, well, this team saw that we weren't able to stop the run. So they're gonna probably run a little bit more than they usually do. Well, we know what this team is yeah. gonna do. So yeah. us being able to put the right people in the right place for this certain type of scheme, which we'll have to see again in a few weeks, uh, I think we will be able to play better than we usually do against the run. So with me saying that is I feel like Air Force won't run for as much as they usually do on this team because of the fact that we'll change our scheme, we'll try to scheme it up. I feel like we have – our secondary can tackle very well. And those are usually the guys who are going to have to make plays because usually those linebackers are going to get covered up. And so we need D-line to get off box. And you need, you, need the, you need the secondary to make tackles and make plays. And I feel like we yeah. that's one of our strengths. I feel like we're going to play really good against this triple option offense. I know it's, it's in left field, but if you just stick with me here with this philosophy, I feel like we're going to do better with a new scheme against a run team that is set to just basically stop the run I think we're going to do good with it. And you heard it here first. So when we get this win on Saturday, just like we always we always seem to hit the nail on the head, man. I don't know what it is. But we're going to play really good against this triple option or triple option offense. Hey, I mean, straight up last week, I, I did suggest I thought Boise State would have a tough time winning that game. I, I, I said it. I, I will own it. You picked Boise State to win. But one thing I also said, is that everybody was like looking at that Vegas line and being like, whoa, bet the house on BYU. Why were they only a one-point favorite early in the week? Why did that line only move to five or six? And even at that point, everybody was like, BYU, BYU, BYU. But fair warning, there, there are a lot of bright lights in Las Vegas, a lot of tall buildings and a lot of wealthy people. And it's because of their ability to be really good at gambling. And to, when you see such an obvious line or what feels like an obvious way to go with the line, I'm just saying slow down sometimes. And it that was the case against Boise State. Granted, I probably would have added a light bulb to, to Vegas if I would have been there. But um, fair warning, and, Bo and Boise State got it done. They, they scored a huge upset. Now we look at this game. Kind of an interesting line on this game, Shane. Boise State favored by three and a half on the blue. Home field is typically worth three points. So if this was a neutral field game, that you know, they're basically saying that these are two evenly matched uh, squads in, in Air Force and Boise State. So uh, with that in mind, who you got? And I also will add over under 51. So they are suggesting like a 28-25 outcome of this ball game. I like Boise State because, you know, even though I know we cannot stop the run, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it again. Our scheme that we put together this week to stop a triple option offense will work, and we will be able to stop that run for the most part. There will be big plays. They will score. This will happen. Mm -hmm. And I think we will be able to play well enough to win the game against this triple option offense. 
uh, the only thing that scares me, and I'm going to say it now, is the play action. I feel like we might get caught up because yeah. I feel like we're going to be so effective in stopping this run that they're going to start mm-hmm. doing some play action. It might catch us a few times. Uh, I think I have been on a B. I mean, I have been on a Boise State team that has gotten almost 200 yards put up on them as far as passing yards go. So I know yep. that it can happen. But yep. I think that will be kind of where we stand. That's my prediction for the game. I think we pull it out. Um, I think we cover. Yeah, I think we cover. I, I I like a few more points to be scored in this game than than fifty one for whatever reason. I think I think Boise State kind of gets into that mid thirty range, and they're able to limit B or uh, to, man. Got I got to move on from BYU. They're able to limit Air Force to again kind of that that twenty eight twenty five twenty eight range. Um, I, I think there's, there's going to be a few more points scored in this game. I think that this team has a little bit of belief now. They have some energy. They have momentum. They have to make sure that they hold on to that against Air Force, who is very good at capturing momentum and and leaving opposing offenses on the sideline. So, uh, But I, I do feel like this team finally kind of found themselves. They found a belief. They removed a lot of that negative energy. And we'll see where it goes from here. But big game against Air Force, then a bye. And then you just worry about the second half of the season after that. Yeah. So you're going over, you're going over, over, and you're going Boise State cover? I, I like over. I like a cover for Boise State. I do. I, I like I don't it. know. I, I think Air Force is extremely dangerous. I think Boise State also could be one of the more complete squads they've played this year. I think I'm going to – I already said Boise State will cover, but I think I'm going to roll the over too. We're at home. Okay. We can score some points. Um, I'm hoping that, you know, offensively, we can probably build on some of this momentum as far as being able to control the trenches. Uh, I'm hoping that happens. I feel like we found some things that work. Let's stick with them. Let's try to build off of it. I think we score some points, too. I think we hit the 30s, too, like you said. Yeah. Well, we'll see how it goes. Kickoff at 7 o'clock on the blue Saturday night, uh, last we heard a couple days ago, 31,000 tickets are out. Still a lot of generous people out there on Twitter trying to either give tickets away or, or buy tickets for families that want to go to the game. It's been pretty cool, pretty inspiring. Uh, something we do see quite a bit through Bronco Nation, but it's it's just awesome when it shows up the way that it has these last few days. Bronco Roundup Game Day Show, 6 to 7 o'clock on the blue. Get you as close to kickoff as humanly possible. Got a lot of storylines to cover. We've talked about a number of them. One we haven't, Khalil Shakir's Crazy Catches. We talk about that a lot. Shane, I think he's number one, man. I, th- I think he's number one. We'll save that for the bye week. And the Canijo <laughs> brothers. Uh, the, Six the, weeks, the Canijo man. brothers are so much fun, man. It's been so much fun to watch their connection, them grow. Little Canijo made a cl- game clinching interception, and big Canijo Kikala uh, called it probably the best play of or, or most memorable play of, of his entire collegiate football career. I think that's pretty cool. I think it's pretty cool that three weeks ago we said at the end of the season we'll have this conversation, and three weeks later we're having this conversation yep. <laughs> on, the top, yep. on the top receiver at Boise State. So uh, he, that'll be interesting for us amazing. to talk about next week. Yeah, he, he's amazing. <laughs> you going to the game, Shane, or where, where are you watching this thing? Um, yeah, I'll be there. Um, you know, I'll be at the tailgate. <laughs> I'll be in my spot. Spot 390, what, what, come on by. Come see me. Spot 390? Spot 390. Come see me. Okay. Well, there, there you go, Bronco Nation. Go hang out with Shane. You can talk about some of the things we discussed here on the podcast. But, my man, have a great weekend. Enjoy the game. And for all you listeners out there, we will see you once again next week here on Jay Sports Bar, serving the Idaho sports community. <laughs>